Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about law and order organized crime with the cast members, Chris Maloney, Dylan McDermott, Danielle Monet truit and Ellen Burstyn. And Chris, I wanted to start with, with talking a little bit about Stabler, because obviously you've had this wonderfully unique experience of, of taking a character that you developed over the course of several years and then bringing him into the iteration of this show. But what I love about the exploration in this show in particular is that there's so many more opportunities to kind of strip him down and explore a lot of the vulnerabilities and the fallibilities of him as a character, mm -hmm. um, you know, even just with the life experience he's had between, you know, when you were originally in the show and, and taking on organized crime. And I was interested for you in, in kind of like the redevelopment process of the character, how that became a really central part of him that really has carried so many great scenes and elements throughout the show in your performance. Well, I'll say that was the cornerstone of the pitch uh, that made me sign on, which is it's uh, not an episodic way of telling the Stabler story or the uh, organized crime story or whatever. It was serialized. And I thought that gives you a lot of more, much more breathing room, a lot more space to explore uh, relationships and moments. And, you know, it's just, it was elbow room. It was breath. And I think, and I'm, I'm, uh, I couldn't agree more. And thank you for recognizing uh, how we're telling the stories of the organized crime unit and Stabler and you know all the characters. I, I just think it, when you serialize it, when you give uh, the actors and the writers eight episodes to explore an issue and explore the dynamics of that issue and the characters involved and the relationships and behaviors, they just get a richer storytelling process. And, uh, so th that's what we've done, and I'm pretty pleased with uh, the outcome. Yeah, no, you really, you really do get all those elements. And and Dylan, you know, with with your portrayal of of Richard, one of the things that's so fun to watch with him as a character is how he's able to unsettle the balance of any moment and really, you know, take other characters off kilter. And sometimes it's things that he says, sometimes it's just a glint in his eye, a wink that he may or may not have given. And so there's so many different facets and ways that you really play around with, with the delivery of that. Um, and I was really interested in, you know, in playing a character that's always thinking a few steps ahead and trying to throw everybody off balance a little bit, how that informs the way that you approach scenes as an actor in, in coming in and trying to create that that type of energy in different ways for your scene partners. Yeah, well, one of the most interesting things for me on, on, on this show was just what was Chris was talking about and you were talking about is the fact that you get these eight episodes. You know, that that really didn't exist before, you know, on, especially on Law and Order. You know, the, it was close-ended. You would meet the bad guy. They would chase him. They would get him and that would be it. You never see him again. But for these eight episodes, you know, we really do get to go home with the bad guy and we get to see another side to him and he becomes more human. He's not just bad, he's complicated. And I think that in itself is really just, was for me the most attractive thing about playing Richard Wheatley was that you get to see this guy with his kids, you get to see him with his wife, you get to see him at home. So it, it's not just a black and white portrait, you know? So. That's what I loved about this. And then, of course, you know, creating this character and and just from the ground up. I love the character work. As I've gotten older, I really love doing character work. And and Richard Wheatley was certainly a great character to play and so much fun, so evil and delicious. He really, really is. And, and Danielle, you know, in talking about Ayana a little bit as well, you know, she's obviously a character who has a lot of fortitude and a lot of confidence. And, you know, there's so many scenes and moments where she's walking into unknown rooms and unknown situations. And so even the body language that you're bringing in those moments has to kind of really lead with this like very specific type of confidence and, and movement. And then there's also moments where she kind of goes into situations, sees that it's not what she thought. And so then it becomes this defensiveness. And I love watching the balance in your performance between those two spaces like when she thinks she's showing up for a meal with her wife and, and she's not there, it's the congressman, all of a sudden that very much kind of shifts the dynamic of the character. And I was interested in, in how you've really approached and enjoyed getting to play around with those dynamics because they live within the same world, but bring different spheres to her. Yeah, um, I, I really enjoy that. I think it kind of goes back to what Chris and Dylan were saying about it being an eight episode arc. Um, and for me, of course, being in all 22 episodes and it being episodic, you know, you you get to delve more into the personal life, you know, these characters and the things that they experience, whether they have to do with their families or whether they have to do with the personal relationships within the task force. 
Um, there's just much more breathing room, much more space, much more opportunity, you know, to develop who this person is, how they think, you know, maybe what things happened in their past that caused them to get defensive in this, in, in certain situations, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that it's not only the procedural in the task force stuff, but you get to see Ayana, you know, outside of that and trying to figure out how to navigate this. You know, she, she kind of just started the uh, organized crime task force like a few years prior. So she's kind of new in her position as well and trying to navigate so many different things, having, you know, Stabler who's been on the force for forever, who has his way of doing things. Um, and then having Nova, you know, who's been undercover and navigating Brewster and, you know, it's just, she literally is getting it from all sides. So it's really fun for me um, to be able to play around with the th those things and figure out, you know, how would she feel in this moment? How would she deal with this situation? Absolutely. And, and Ellen, you know, in talking about your performance, um, you know, you're, you're playing a character where there's a lot of moments where there's, there's kind of facets of information that she's looking for. You know, we see it right at the very beginning when she mistakes a young boy for being Elliot or a moment where she forgets that Elliot's wife has passed away. And I love, I love your performance in those moments because we get to kind of see the processing of a character who knows that there's something a little amiss or that there's a piece of information that she's forgotten or is missing. And the way that you then kind of look for the information, the truth that she can find right in front of her to like find that path back within her own mind. Um, and so I was really interested in, in how you approach that, that dynamic and, and relationship that she has in terms of, of memory and truth and just finding the information when she doesn't have it right in front of her straight away. Yeah, well, it's a complicated thing because she's bipolar. And she's on medication for that, which keeps her fairly steady. Um, but she also has a little bit of um, aging, you know, in her uh, in her brain. N not not severe like Alzheimer's or something, but you know, there's a, a process where she's um, losing it a bit. So. Uh, and then there are times when she's completely centered and straight and normal. Um, so finding that balance of when to go off and, you know, when the dementia is appearing and then when she's very centered. Um, interesting process. <laughs> and of course, working with Chris, it's just so much fun because he's such a good actor. You know, he's um, very present and it's truly his show. I mean, he, he's Mr. Boss Man on that set. And, <laughs> you, said and those you said those lines wonderfully. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> yeah, well, you wrote them, you know. <laughs> no, he... He's really fun to work with. I, I love being on the show. And it's a complicated character. It's, you know, the, sometimes she's totally present and sometimes she's not. I, I, I've been enjoying finding those, those moments when she's not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a fantastic performance to to watch all of those moments. And and Danielle and Chris, kind of coming back to the two of you and the dynamic between your characters, you know, I always think what's so interesting is when you look at all the situations and scenarios that they're thrown into together on the show, the level of intrinsic trust that they have to have with one another is so unique within that environment. And they also exist in a world with one another where they are able to call each other out on things. Maybe Ayana towards Stabler a little bit more than the other way around a lot of the time, um, you know, but it, it always comes from such a place of love and mutual respect and care that they have for one another. And I was interested in, in how the two of you, you know, especially going through the second season worked to really build on all of the foundational elements of that relationship that you'd created in season one and to add, you know, even more aspects of, of that trust and that care as they come together even more. Uh, well, he's the boss, but I'm going to go first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, well, like Ellen was saying, you know, Chris is pretty easy to work with. Like he's, he is a great actor. He does care very much um, about the show. He cares about every aspect of the show. 
Um, not it's not like blah 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 my line blah blah blah. You know, he, he <laughs> luckily he cares about us all. Um, and so it is a joy to work with him. I have to say, when I first started, I was kind of thrown into the show so quickly. I was like trying to get my bearings and. You know, I knew who he was, but, you know, I didn't know him personally. I was so nervous um, the first few weeks of work. Um, so I really had to, like, go into, like, the strength of my character because I was very nervous, like, <laughs> shoot, shooting. Um, and when I look back on it, I'm like, wow, you can't even see how nervous I was, like, in a lot of these scenes. But he made it so, he made me feel so comfortable. Like when I got on set, you know, gave me a big hug. He was super excited to be working with me. And it immediately kind of helped me bring my guard, you know, down. And then as we've been working together more often, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm starting to learn him. Danielle is starting to learn Chris more. And I think Chris is starting to learn me more. And now that my guard is down, I'm becoming more of who I am. And I think we respect each other. And it shows in our performance, you know, on, on screen. And for me personally, with my character, it's very important for me for her to not come off like the angry Black woman, like the woman that's just strong all the time and doesn't have you know, any layers to her, any dimensions to her, you know, so whenever I can find moments of compassion, whenever I can, I feel like the mama bear of the show, you know, whenever I can find those moments to like love on the people that I work with in her, in a way that's still strong, I try to like take advantage of those moments. So I think they play out in a lot of me and um, Chris's scenes, which I'm grateful for. Um. I'll just chime in here with this. My, you know, my take of, of your, to your, to your question was I think Danielle and I, uh, our characters were written in such a way that we were, we tiptoed into, to develop a relationship, right? You know, she did, I was a white guy of a certain age, you know, kind of the old bold, here was a black woman, sergeant, y you know, tasked with running uh, the, the ship, you know, and, and I, I thought that was a very interesting dynamic. And I think there's more to that to explore. I think our relationship has evolved. Uh, I think there's more to explore there. Um, and, and I, uh, I really think um, that Danielle's character is uh, in the coming season seasons, God willing, is ripe <laughs> for a, a richer, deeper, um, development. I, I think that we've only just scratched the surface. Um, that's how I feel about it. And, and, and I'm very happy with the, how she and I play together. And, you know, we work very hard at finding the moments that, you know, the, the moments of coming together, the moments of doubt or the moments of berating or, you know, and or, or when it's, it's, it's like confrontational, you know, these are all, these are fun things to play and they just make for, you know, richness of and dynamism. So there you go. That's how I feel. And, Can I answer and, the question? <laughs> it does. And and similarly, you know, Chris and Ellen in talking about this, this really beautiful mother-son relationship on oh. screen. Um, I was interested in how you found some of the aspects in terms of where that that flips in terms of who's the parent in any given moment, because even within singular scenes that changes, you know, it's like when Stabler comes home and mm -hmm. she's smoking and it's like, I'm just having one, you know, that he's becoming the parent in a lot of ways. And it's not necessarily about him being a partial caretaker for her. It's just the dynamic of them being in a house together and, and what happens is, you know, he's an adult now there with his adult mom. Um, and I was interested in how you went into a lot of scenes with a lot of playfulness with that dynamic in, in the two of them kind of sparring off of each other, because also a lot of the comedy that comes through between the two of you and the humor of, of that relationship also comes from those moments. Well, <laughs> we play, we play together. But we, um, but we work hard to find that play, right? I mean, in every scene, you and I really try to navigate what, what we're doing, what, what's, what, you know, what are the straits that we're navigating through? Don't you don't you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the last scene of, of the episode, um, the night before we were shooting it, 9:30 at night, Chris is on the phone with me 
um, rewriting the scene. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, my, my dinner's ready. I'm, I'll call you right back. <laughs> Quick gets off, eats his dinner, and then he's back on the phone. Um, and this is 9.30 at night. Uh, he's a very hard worker and he doesn't let anything go by. There's no unimportant um, scene or line or moment. Um, I got a good laugh on the set one day when um, after a take, he said, was that all right? I changed the line. And I said, you? And the, the crew broke up. <laughs> Gives you an indication. But, you know, to, to, to Alan's point, I mean, and, and I think uh, uh, Dylan will attest to this, that, you know, when you're working with accomplished actors, we're all kind of speaking the same language. So we'll be doing a scene and, you know, whether it's Danielle or Dylan, and, you know, we just kind of look at each other with a sour look on our face going, you know, that I either don't get that moment or this is not, this is, there's a better way to get to wherever we're looking to go or there's a, you know, better dynamic or there's, you know, so I, I think, you know, you get actors who understand script, understand story and relationships and behavior. And all of a sudden you, you're really on a team, you know, trying to make the play work to the best of its ability. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Dylan, coming back to you, one of the other things that I wanted to ask you about was, you know, <coughs> you, you, you've talked, you talked a lot in season one about, you know, really seeing Richard Wheatley in terms of animal comparisons as like an octopus and he's got his tentacles everywhere. But what's really fascinating is that he does so with like such stillness and there's this real stoicness. It's not about him physically being in a lot of places. It's him being able to look at someone across the room and being able to completely get in their mind and, and mess with them however he's, he's planning to or wants to in that moment and I was interested in how you really found a lot of that stillness and stoicness within him as a character and in your performance when you first came on board in season one well I'd like to speak to uh, what Chris said too is you know <clears throat> working on organized crime um, it's it's serious acting you know and I will say that one time Alan doesn't remember this but I took a um, a class at the actor's studio and you were moderating and I learned a great deal from you and the seriousness of you as a teacher, I learned. And Chris and I went to the neighborhood playhouse to the same school, so we speak the same language. And Danielle you know, co-wrote a one woman play. So we're all very serious in our craft and that I think is on the set when you arrive. Um, it's just there, it's, it's, in, it's in the DNA of organized crime and I love that. That's why I enjoy it. That's why I did another season of it because it's all there. And so yeah, I always try to look for, you know, that animal part of whatever character I'm playing, I'm, I'm looking for that. But, you know, Richard Wheatley, there, there was so much I used from my own life with this guy. You know, my mother's boyfriend was a bank robber. I used parts of him and the ilk that was around him, you know, all the, the gangsters that he surrounded himself with. And then growing up in Manhattan and waiting on gangsters and being around them and having to, you know, keep the bar open until they were done. Sometimes the bar would close at four and they would leave at seven in the morning because that's when they were done. So I think, you know, in growing up in New York, frankly, you know, when you, I got to observe so much and see so much and, you know, I'm a great observer and great studier. So I love to do that. So by the time Richard Wheatley found me, I was ready for him. You know, and with what you were saying as well about that shared language that you all have on the show, you know, and you and Chris in particular having, you know, coming from that same school of acting. I've, I've also heard you both talk about Meisner technique as well as, as being a place where a lot of it stems from for you both. And so how does that influence the way that you're working on scenes together when you come in with this kind of electricity of a shared language already into an, any sort of moment? Well, for me, for me, um, how I downloaded and translate the Meisner technique for me is that moment to moment, the moment to momentness of everything. You know, you can do um, uh, all of the work you want, all the, the, you know, what's my super objective type stuff. But, but, you know, at the end of the day, for me, to me, the rubber hits the road. If you're in the moment, you're just kicking it back and forth and there's not too much sauce on it or, you know, you know, you know, that that's like, 
that comes later to me. You know, you ladle it on more sauce, so you bring, you know, you mute it down, you understand those colors. But it, at the end of the day, it's, you know, so all of a sudden you have a person who went through the same technique, which I would liken it to, they, they intentionally attempted to make you go crazy with the repetition. That's, that's how it affected me. <laughs> but, you know, so I, I just, that was it, moment to moment. And that, that's the kind of the cornerstone of it. Again, that's how I translate it. Is that similar for you, Dylan? Yeah, you know, I mean, I studied with San, Sandy. Um, so, you know, I got <laughs> firsthand what it was like, that, that technique. And he, he's always on my shoulder. He's always talking to me. He always tells me if it's good enough. You know, when I walk away from a scene, he's always in, he's always there with me. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's the, it's between the actor's studio um, and the neighborhood playhouse. That, that's how I formed my technique. Everybody's different. Everybody does it differently. It doesn't matter how you arrive, as long as you arrive. But that's, you know, that, that's how I, I came into, why well, I started working and then I found that I was still lacking something. So I went to the studio and, I really, it really filled something inside of me. And once I was able to grab that, I was off to the races. I love that. And, you know, Ellen, coming back to, to some of what you were talking about with, with your character before in terms of, you know, the, the portrayal of someone who is bipolar and then, you know, the added element of there being moments in the show where she's taking her medication, she's on her lithium, and then there being moments where she's off of it for different reasons. You know, at the beginning, she's trying not to take it for herself. There's moments where it's withheld from her later on. Um, and I thought that you played that calibration really interestingly in terms of what that means for her at, at every point. Point. And it's it's also so so fascinating because it's not an experience that's monolithic. It's not the same for every single person with that disorder and, and with medication. And so how did you kind of approach it in terms of researching, look at what looking at what the different dynamics of that could be to really figure out what made the most sense for your character and your performance? Well, you know, I I read a lot um, as I researched it. Uh, and read the different kinds of uh, ways that that can manifest. Um, but then it really becomes what's needed for the scene. You know, some scenes it needs for her to um, be more off and other times she's more present. Like that last scene we did in the last episode, she's very present. Um, so it, you know, it depends on what's, uh, what works, what's required for fulfilling the scene. And that usually presents itself in, in a pretty clear way. Yeah. I, I think that's so interesting in terms of your performance with those scenes. It's so great to watch. And, and Danielle, you know, I've heard you say that, that with, with this show in particular, that one of the challenges is, you know, when you're, when you're doing these kind of three chunks of eight episodes as a whole season, that one of the challenges is how to make sure you're always doing something different, how to make sure you're always finding something new in terms of the character. And, and obviously there's always new situations, scenarios, scenes, elements that you're getting about your character to add on to that foundation. But also it's, you know, when they're having similar scopes of conversation, conversations or assessing information or interrogating someone, how to make that always feel different. And so in the journey of working on the show for a couple of seasons now, what have you found to be the answer for yourself in, in how to always make sure you're accomplishing that? Um, well, I mean, some of it is a little bit more technical. Sometimes we have to sit down and actually go through the scene <laughs> and make sure like that it makes sense to where the character is at the specific point that we're at. Uh, in the series, like, you know, how many times has she said this sentence? <laughs> how many times has she had this idea that she's expressed to Stabler? Is it necessary for us to say it again? You know, is there something new we can say? Uh, I think that's why I love our show is because it is a collaborative effort. You know, there's a lot of other shows where you don't get that element of collaboration, you know, between the different departments working together to make it as good as it can be. Um, I think the other thing that helps is to actually like have an emotional life for your character. We all know in real life, before we came on this Zoom, there were things we were dealing with, things we were talking about, things we experienced before we got on the Zoom that um, it helps 
uh, what's the word? I'm sorry. Um, whatever we're doing in our emotional life basically has, it shows up in whatever we're choosing to do at the moment. So I'm doing a Zoom, but before I was doing a Zoom with you guys, I was having a conversation with, you know, this person about this and it informs my attitude, it informs my spirit, my energy, and all of that informs what I'm doing right now. Um, and I think I try to, my process as an actor is all about thought, like the thought life of, um, of a character. Um, and like Chris and Dylan were saying, the moment to moment. And so, you know, when I'm having a certain conversation, like there was a scene with me and Chris where I was telling him like, you know, there's so many things I have going on that you don't even know about. And I don't get to escape from my life just because I have other stuff, you know, happening that I don't want to deal with. I don't get to go undercover and hide from those things, you know? And so she's not just talking about work, you know, she's talking about being a new mother. She's <laughs> talking about being a wife and navigating her career and personal life. She's talking about the challenges of even being in the position that she's in. There's just a whole lot of stuff that goes behind every interaction that goes behind, you know, uh, everything that I'm saying to these different characters. And then I think, you know, like it's working together, you know, sometimes there's things I don't see in the scene that Chris is like, hey, have you thought about this? And I'm like, oh, that's a, that's great. You know, and so, you know, we play around, you know, and like, like they were saying before, it's all about playing, you don't ever come to work, or at least I don't, I can't speak for everyone else, but I never come to work and say, this is how I'm going to do this scene. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do the scene until we get together and we start working it out, you know, and then most of the time it ends up better than we ever even thought it would be in the first place. Um, you know, and coming back to you, Chris, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the calibration of your performance and the pacing of Stabler's energy based on who's in his world, because it's so different depending on which character it is. You know, when he's undercover, when he's in the field, there's this real kind of surge of adrenaline that he relies on. Um, you know, when he's with Wheatley, it's very much about him trying to, you know, read situations as fast as he can, read everything around him to play catch up with whatever breadcrumbs have been left for him. You know, and then when you share scenes with Marishka, it feels like both of their worlds kind of really slow down for a moment because they don't have to kind of put a face on for one another. They don't have to say a lot of things. They've got this real internalized dialogue that the two of you have obviously created over several years. And so how do you work to kind of recalibrate the pacing and the energy, energy of your character based on who's in his world at that particular moment? Well, I, I, I think the pacing is a, a, a product of the character that I'm having my engagement with. For example, Wheatley, to Stabler represents the man who destroyed my life. You know, he took my wife. He, he caused uh, catastrophe. So, you know, Stabler's sense of justice is now a personal issue. And it's so, you know, uh, to Dylan's point about uh, the animal aspect of it. I mean, I think what you see is th these two animals looking to tear each other limb from limb. Um, so that's that the energy you get with there. This, you know, nothing is uh, um, easy. N you know, it may be still, but it's not easy. And Mariska, to me, you know, I, I don't know about the, the faster, the slower, the, 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 I think their relationship to me uh, resonates a, a sense of gravity, a sense of weight, and yet it's effortless. You know, so I kind of, and I, I guess it's because of uh, that history of emotion and relationship and all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I guess what you see is, uh, based on how I feel about the relationships, that what, the, what these people mean to Stabler in his life, what Absolutely. they represent in his life. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and Dylan, obviously one of the things that you've so deliciously explored through Richard Wheatley is just this real narcissism that lives within him. Um, mm -hmm. And what was so fun with the second season and your character coming back is that it was like the wheels are off. You know, he's not 
He's not hiding in the shadows. He's always there in broad daylight. He's mm. letting Stabler know exactly, you know, maybe not how he's going to do things, but kind of what his intentions are and, and how he wants to play a game. And, you know, he's kind of like leading this real cat and mouse. And so did you feel that there was a lot more breadth in which you could play to a lot of that narcissistic dynamic, given that he's not trying to pretend that anything is any less than face value in this season? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> Funny you should bring that up because I did a lot of uh, research on, on <laughs> narcissism specifically and malignant narcissism, um, which is the, the highest form if, there is, if there's such a thing. Um, so I really studied, you know, the behavior of, of people and what do they do? And apparently there's, there's um, no difference with narcissists. Their behavior is all the same. So I found that really intriguing. Um, there's no variation. I should say. So uh, I did a deep dive on that in terms of weekly and, and, and watched all these uh, YouTube videos on, on um, people and their behavior and their psychoses. Um, so that really helped me. And, and then, as you said, we, he really wasn't trying to hide anything more anymore. He was who he was. And again, that was so fun to play because there was there was no holes barred, you know, it was just like, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do and be exactly who I am. And there's not going to be um, any remorse inside of me. And I thought that it was like, wow, what a, what a way to live and, and to operate. So that was, uh, again, you know, I love to do research. I love to talk to, to real people and sit down and pick people's brains and, find out, you know, what they eat and how they walk and how they talk and all that stuff is fascinating to me. It's why, that's why I love acting. It's kind of like being a detective. You know, there's something about that whole process that turns me on. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate all of you sharing so many in-depth details. There are so many, you know, complexities and details that go into every single nuanced aspect of your performances in the show. So it's really fascinating to hear all the behind the scenes of that. And thank you so much to, to the four of you. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you. For